Well, we are going to introduce Ethan Cassini, who obtained a master's degree in aerospace engineering from the University of Sheffield with a double minor in control theory and robotics. He is currently a research scientist at Airbus Robotics okay. and undertaking a PH in control from the Uni University of Sheffield, ah, bueno, de, de focusing de on multi-robot system. He is the recipient of several scholarships, including the EPSRC Research Scholarship, Airbus UK Research at the RS Grassroots Students Scholarship. His research interests include multi-agent applications of RL, optimal control and robotics, and has experience in the aerospace and semiconductor manufactur manufacturing sectors. So we are going to uh, listen to his speech. Thank you, thank you, Karina, and thank you, Eduardo. Can you all hear me okay? Sure thing. Yes. Fantastic. So uh, good good afternoon and good evening to myself. Um, as Karina said, I'm, I'm Ethan, and I am now a second year PhD student at the University of Sheffield. Um, and today's talk is on scaling robotic capability using multi-agent systems. And we'll talk a little bit about the applications of those systems, particularly in the three fields I'm most interested in, which is agriculture, construction, and manufacturing. Um, I will try and keep this as top and top level as possible. I will try not to go too much into the theory um, because there's a lot of maths behind multi-agent systems and I don't want to um, alienate everyone. If I do start to talk too fast, please let me know. Um, I've been told that when I get excited and passionate about something, I tend to speed up the way I talk. Um, and if that is the case, please feel free to let me know. Additionally, I will have some time at the end for questions, but if there's something you want to ask me midway through, um, you know, Karina and Eduardo, if you can point me, point them out to me, I'm happy to answer any questions. So I'll give my a little, little bit of an explanation to myself. So as Karina mentioned, I graduate with an honors degree in aerospace engineering with a double minor in control theory and robotics. And during this kind of five year period of my undergraduate and graduate degrees, I also had some experience working as a robotics engineer in semiconductor and aerospace firms. One of those firms was a the largest semiconductor manufacturer in the United Kingdom, ASM Assembly Systems, that uh, bottom photo there. Unfortunately, I don't have any photos from within the factory because six months into my placement, the COVID-19 pandemic started and I wasn't able to get any pictures of me actually working with the robots. But the project we worked on at ASM, we were looking at things of integrating robotics into manufacturing lines, particularly with pick and place and also with complex assembly. So things such as screwing and drilling, tasks that are very tedious for a human to do. We wanted to expand that to allow non-humans to do it. Yes, Eduardo? Um, uh, Ethan, uh, we are seeing your uh, your wallpaper. In this case, mm -hmm. we are seeing OBS, oh. but not the not the presentation. <laughs> ah, I am so sorry. Let me change that. That's my fault. Um, can you see it okay now? There you yeah. are. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. My Thank mistake. You very much. Okay, so that bottom image, <laughs> which I mentioned earlier, is the. Um, is me outside of ASM, uh, just as the COVID-19 pandemic started here in the UK. Of course, we went into lockdown, so I wasn't able to get any pictures inside. That top picture is uh, myself. I'm in the middle there, and I am with my team. We built a drone um, that was able to achieve fully autonomous flight for about 20 minutes before the rain started. Um, the UK is well known for its rainy weather. Yes, Eduardo? No, your hand is still raised. I think for his mistake. I'll continue. I guess he, he, yeah, I, I I think he didn't listen to your question, but you everything is okay now. Okay. Not a problem. And we won the competition for that drone. Um, unfortunately, the drone did not survive the uh, notorious British weather. Following on from 
uh, my undergraduate degrees, I end up take, starting a PhD in control in 2021. And I'm working on multi-agent theory, particularly in the field of robotics. And during this, my PhD is also sponsored by Airbus. And through that, I'm also a research scientist at Airbus Robotics. So I work on projects directly with Airbus. So before I go too, too deep into the topic of today's um, presentation, I just want to say a big thank you to all of our sponsors at the University of Sheffield. So our lab, the Digital Digitization and Manufacturing Lab at the University of Sheffield, we are quite fortunate to have quite a lot of sponsors. So the big ones here is Airbus, Siemens, GK and Aerospace. But we also have companies such as Jaguar Land Rover uh, and Dyson. Within the UK, we also have the Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre, which is the University of Sheffield's own kind of spin out and kind of startup company for, in for industrial automation. And we also have the National Physical Laboratory and uh, UKRI EPSRC, the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. Also, as a disclaimer to everyone, my work is funded through the Royal Academy of Engineering and is covered by an NDA. So there are certain things I won't be talking about um, and there may be questions I cannot answer, but we'll cover those when we get there. So to put the context of robotics into manufacturing, we kind of have to go back quite a few years to the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the Industrial Revolution is considered one of the biggest explosions of industrial research in the past you know, uh, century. And it is generally assumed that the Industrial Revolution was only about 10 to 15 years. In reality, the revolution lasted 100 years. And during this time, as we can see from this picture here, there was a massive increase in the amount of automation. But back in the 1700s and the 1800s, this automation was very much limited to you know, handcrafted machines and people operating these machines. Now, this 100 years saw the change in the way we produce things. One of the most famous things was from Henry Ford. Henry Ford is famous for Ford Motor Company, and he was famous with saying, you can have any Model T you want as long as it's in the color black. And the idea behind that is we can build automation lines that will speed up the process of assembly, provided that everything is the same every single time. This led to the term Industry 4.0, which is a German term from, that originated in the 1980s and the 1990s, which looked at now how do we automate beyond the process we currently do. And this picture is from the Airbus factory in North Wales here in the UK. And it's uh, Airbus manufacturing operatives and engineers using um, electrical hand tools that are connected to the internet, which means they cannot make any mistakes when doing any of the assembly. Now, this is great. This is a good start, and it does show how we can digitize our systems to allow us to collect data and to um, further autonomize the process. But going even further, how do we even improve beyond that? Well, the answer is robotics. Now, robotics tends to be thrown around a lot, combined with artificial intelligence, to kind of justify massive spending within companies. But a statistic that you may not know is that of the robotics projects that are started with within aerospace and other manufacturing um, firms, only about 20% of those projects end up seeing any fruition or any funding, purely because people have this idea that robotics can solve every problem, as opposed to the actual reality, which is robotics can solve a few problems, and we have to spend a lot of time actually doing them. What has helped with robotics, however, is its commercialization. And this video here from Boston Dynamics, and I'm just hoping it shows up well on your screen, Probably a very famous video, probably a lot of you have seen this. It is Boston Dynamics' Atlas robot. And here you have it being able to perform tasks in a similar manner to a human. Now, I'm not saying I jump around like it does when I'm walking, and I certainly don't walk like that. I hope I don't anyway. But we saw it being able to handle a complex environment, lift up heavy tools, and also navigate in uncertain surroundings. So scaffolding like this is quite difficult. We're seeing it able to you know, throw a heavy device and, and figure out where it's going to land and therefore how it should throw it. And one of the big things with this is performing complex tasks simply. And whilst this little flip at the end is more showboating, it does illustrate how interesting and complex these tasks can become. A more applied solution is perhaps uh, Boston Dynamics' stretch robot. Now, this robot is actual production. You can actually go and buy this robot, provided you have half a, half a million US dollars. And what this robot can do is anything with pick and place. It can pick up any item with its vacuum grippers, provided there's a flat surface. It can categorize the item, and then it can move it to another position. Now, arguably, Boston Dynamics' most famous robot, Boston Dynamics Spot, is the most fully fledged legged robotic in existence. 
It has all sorts of sensors and cameras and is capable of a lot of tasks, combining it with its manipulator. We actually do have a Boston Dynamics spot here at the University of Sheffield, and it's quite fully featured, but it does have some limitations. But if, can we go any further? What other things can we do with these robots? So this work here is from colleagues at the at ETH Zurich in Switzerland, where they designed an aerial drone to be able to collect environmental data from trees and other wildlife environments. And this is a really interesting kind of um, perspective on these robots, because previously this task would have to be done by humans. And what we've observed, particularly in, in specific ecological studies, is that humans actually destroy the environment they're in. You know, we are naturally quite a destructive species. These robots will allow us to autonomously go and collect data samples from branches or from animals and then allow us to evaluate the environment we're around. This robot was also demonstrated in the paper they published in Science Robotics that they are capable of doing um, picking and placing from trees as well. So for instance, if you run, for instance, um, some friends in California and kind of Baja California, they're capable of doing autonomous inspection of their vineyards. So if you make a lot of wine, you'll be capable of inspecting whether the, the grapes you are producing are actually up to standard. Another kind of idea is through John Deere. Now, I won't get into the politics of John Deere tractors. They are, as it is, controversial. They don't need me to go deep into that. But John Deere have uh, decided in recent years to go fully autonomous. And what you're seeing here is the first fully autonomous set of tractors, combine harvesters, and other agricultural machines that can be used. It can be used on a construction uh, on a agricultural environment to allow it to operate autonomously. Now, this is quite a massive change as well. In previous years, John Deere have expressly said they don't want to get involved in any autonomous systems, but recent changes, including the affordability of robotics and autonomous systems, has led them to change their tone. So I've given you that introduction, and you're probably thinking at this point, well, what's the downside? Well, there are quite a few major points that need to be addressed, and unfortunately, Robots aren't perfect, but there are a couple of major ones, particularly size. So this is a video from my hometown down here in, uh, in sunny or somewhat sunny England. Uh, this is some drone footage that I took of the surrounding area around my village. Now, if you notice, this is all farmland. This is all owned by two or three farms and it's massive. And it's probably not as big as some farms you may see in Mexico or North America, but can, performing tasks on this environment, including just herding animals or planting and growing crops, becomes increasingly difficult given the size. It's been noted that farms um, in this area can take up to a week to fully traverse by a single human to make sure that everything is okay. This doesn't make it feasible at all for any sort of agricultural processes. And if you have a single robot or a single tractor, it will take forever to achieve any task. Similarly, aircraft. Uh, this is a picture of the now discontinued, unfortunately, a Airbus A380 aircraft. It is the largest aircraft that is currently flying in the skies, uh, superseding the Boeing uh, 747. And this is a massive aircraft. And given you can see the people down here at the very bottom, you can see the person standing next to the wheel. That just gives you a, 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 an idea of the size and the scope of these vehicles, making it virtually impossible for a single robot to complete all these tasks. There is at Airbus's facility in North Wales a robot that does drilling, and it takes approximately four days to drill every single hole on the wing, which is by no means a easy, easy trick. So what are the main limitations with de deploying robotics into main, uh, main agricultural construction and manufacturing? So there are three main ones. The first is a single robot, as we've discussed, is not capable of completing large tasks efficiently you know, one robot is not able to perform every task in such a way that is completely applicable to the manufacturer or the producer. The second is sim to real or simulation to reality. What works in simulation doesn't always work in the real world. Our real world is a very noisy and a very uncertain environment with a lot of randomness. And if you've ever tried to drive on a road, you'll know just how random people can be. And, you know, from everything from not signaling when making a turn, to suddenly breaking, we are a very random species. And that links with our final point, which is humans and robots don't always work well together. 
Um, I'm sure you've seen videos of people getting hit by robots or not robots not able to detect a human. We are not great at working together. Now we could talk for hours about all three of these and I am happy to answer any questions about the other two topics, but to keep today's presentation within an hour, we will instead just talk about the first topic, which is my main area of research, which is how we take things that work for a single robot and translate it to multi-robot systems. So to begin with, we need a very brief introduction to what a multi-agent system is. And I'll try and keep this as high level as possible. Um, if it is too complex, please tell me and we will move on very quickly. So we define uh, multi-agent systems as a N player Markov game based on something called the Markov chain. The idea of a Markov chain is that every decision leads to a new set of decisions. But every, given a position on this chain, it does not matter where you've come from, only where you are going. So every decision here, as you can see on this tree, leads to a new set of decisions that you can make, and so on and so forth. And you can traverse this chain as you make it through the game. We define a Markov game as a set of states, S, a set of actions per agent, which is A, some transition functions that translate between what we have done in the environment, the reward we see or payout based on what we've done and how many players are in the game. The objective of each agent is to minimize, but it's sorry, it's to is to maximize the global payout of all the agents across some policy. And this translates to some maximum policy that we see here. We, were, we are looking for something called the Nash equilibrium strategy, or sometimes referred to as the Pareto optimal strategy, which is provided that an agent knows what other agents are doing in the environment we can comfortably say that the optimal action at A asterisk is better than the non-optimal action given that all the other agents are taking their best action. That is it on Markov games. We will not talk about it anymore. If I mention Markov's games, you are free to tell me to mute myself. How do we solve Markov games? There is no general solution for Markov games. That is unfortunately the way it is with current control theory. There are a lot of different methods, a lot of things such as how we apply optimal control, you can use machine learning methods, but the solution is there is really two different types of agents, cooperative and uncooperative. Cooperative agents, you can generally assume that they all operate together and therefore you can solve them together. Uncooperative agents, you cannot solve them together because they are all doing their own thing and therefore you have to provide individual solutions. It also depends on whether the game is discrete or continuous, finite or infinite discrete or continuous, and an example of a discrete game is a game like chess or Go or Shogi. Continuous would be something like walking through a field with, an, with or a game of football. Um, finite or infinite, a game of chess has an end, you know, someone has to win. But for instance, if you're walking through a field, provided that this field is an infinite plane, you will never reach the end of this field. And computing Nash equilibrium is not, is not so simple. You can have hundreds of thousands of states and sometimes it can take forever to converge on a solution. So Markov games are still a very open area of research. And you know, if you're a mathematician and you want some easy funding for a PhD, a Markov game is a perfect way to go forth. But we can use optimal control to compute actions for each agent. Some brief uh, methods. So this work here by Agarwal on the left-hand side, is treating self-driving cars as an autonomous Markov game in that the car here on the bottom is the is a car being observed by um, the car on the top. A black car, the black line here is the autonomous path. And they are trying to determine what the other agent is going to do. And they can forecast based on using Markov games to determine what the optimal path is and to avoid crashing into the other car. Similarly, humans and robots can collaborate together. This work by Leah Tao from a few years ago that showed we can actually model human-robot collaboration as a Markov game. Now, these are very high-level papers, and I should also note that the paper on the right was also retracted from the conference because there was, uh, I believe, a, uh, a, an incorrect method in their, in their algorithm, but they did state they are still going to resubmit to another conference. Now, we've talked about Markov games, and we've talked about multi-agent theory, now we need to translate it to robotics. So we need to first determine how robots function in our world. How do we translate what we do as humans, how and how we go about our environment, to what a robot does? 
And there is something called the big feedback loop of robotics, which is the three essential elements of a robotics system to function like a human. And it is, I tried to make it the three Ps, but nothing really fits. So we have perception, planning, and control. Perception is your standard, how you see the world, how you understand the world. Planning is how you decide to move through the world, you know, when you use Google Maps or when you decide to use Waze. And control is, you know, the speed you walk at or how, whether you take the motorway or a car. And these loops are infinite. Once you perceive the environment, you plan. And once you've planned, you apply some control law and then you continue the circle. You never end this circle. It is completely infinite. So step one, perception. Sometimes referred to as state estimation in some literature, it is how we observe our surroundings, how we determine what is around us in the world. There are a lot of different ways of doing this. And because our world is very noisy, we need to account for uncertainty in our measurements. When we talk about uncertainty, we generally talk about things such as our sensors are not perfect, our cameras are very um, inefficient, or whatever we're using to see our world is providing some sort of noise to our measurements. Now, standard state estimation, uh, this is a simple um, Kalman filter Markov chain. We have some measurement at xt. Um, we have some state at xt, sorry, and some measurement said t. We apply a action, ut, and through estimation, we can say where we are going next. We can also use things such as computer vision. Computer vision now is becoming very popular, particularly in areas such as simultaneous localization and mapping and other methods that allow us to in, examine our surroundings, but also see what is in our surroundings. It is all very nice to say, well, this object is 10 meters ahead of us. What is that object? How does it reflect on what we are trying to do? And this can be done with a variety of things from cameras, LIDAR, and force sensors. And something as simple as a Kalman filter can also be used to reject uncertainty. So the blue line that you see here is a very noisy sensor signal. And the orange line that you can just about see there is the filtered signal. So we take something very noisy and applying a very simple filter uh, that has been around since the 70s, we can reduce the uncertainty in our measurements. How does this translate to multi-robot perception? Well, the answer is not very well. Unfortunately, multi-robot systems for perception have become very stagnant in the last 20 years. But some work in recent years, such as multi-agent SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping, has allowed multiple robots to map out an environment here. So what this work from Filatov and Krinkin determined is that you can actually map out, in this case, a building using multiple robots. And then comparing the maps of each robot, we can overlay them together and using some sort of filter, reject the uncertainty and give us a more complete map of the environment. And what in Filatov's paper they determined was scaling the number of robots, allow them to cover the environment much quicker. And this sort of factory level environment they were able to cover in an hour, as opposed to a single robot doing it in a day. Possibly the most famous um, current robot in the world right now is Ingenuity. Ingenuity is the helicopter on Mars. And I am a big fan of Ingenuity. Um, I actually uh, was one of the few people to get to see it before it took off. And what you have here on the bottom work from Pilizzi in 2022 was they actually demonstrated that we can use multiple Ingenuities combined together to map out the Martian surface. One of the things that Ingenuity is doing now is that it's mapping out the environment ahead of Perseverance's work across the planet's surface. But if we have multiple of these Ingenuity helicopters, we'd be able to map out more of the Martian surface and therefore deploy more robots. There's a very famous quote that says, one robot on Mars is robotics, many robots on Mars is automation. And that is where we want to go to. If we do end up wanting to colonize both Luna and Mars, we will have to deploy multiple robots. And so developing good algorithms that allow us to do so is very important. And finally, this is a bit of a theoretical talk about how graph neural networks can be used. And this is a kind of building on the method by Filatov and Krinkin on the left here that allows us to combine the various inputs from various uh, autonomous vehicles, combine them together and get an estimate of the world around us. And this was a very interesting paper for two reasons. One, they showed they could reject uncertainty and provide a high definition map of the environment. And two, they proved that their algorithm is scalable. In Filatov and Krinkin's paper, they only ever used five robots as their maximum. In Zhu's paper, they were able to scale up to 20 robots at a single time without any loss 
of kind of the effect of their environment. Additionally, Zhu's paper was only using a digital camera, was not using any other sensors. Whilst there is some drawbacks to using a digital camera, and most of them can be observed just by reading of all the um, crashes um, by Tesla self-driving cars, this demonstrates that we can actually limit the amount of sensors we get and therefore improve our bandwidth. However, it is not all um, sunshine and rainbows. There are some open challenges, particularly how do agents generate or reference a global map? Do they construct their individual maps, as we discussed with uh, Filatov's paper, and then compare their maps? Or do they just upload all their data to some cloud server that allows them to compute all the maps together? How they do this is a little bit up for debate. On the one hand, computing individual maps and then uploading them is simpler on the computer on the drone or the robot, but is far more expensive in terms of internet bandwidth. But if you're just referencing a global map without any uh, onboard compute, you will end up running into massive bandwidth issues. However, if you do individual maps, this can put a lot of strain on the onboard computer, and it's a trade-off. Similarly, communication between agents. In game theory, there is a general feeling that agents should not be able to communicate. But we want these agents to communicate. We want to be able to understand why agent A has seen something, but agent B hasn't. And this communication between agents takes a lot of bandwidth. And how much information do we transfer? For instance, if two agents are traversing an environment, do they both need to go over the same place twice? It's very difficult to determine that. And therefore, it is a massive open challenge, particularly in large agent groups. And this leads to kind of the, one of the points is overlapping data samples and artifacting. If you have multiple sensors, you will have to understand how these sensors are affecting each other. Particularly, one of the big failures that we've had in you know, recent weeks is the recent unfortunate tragedy with Ocean Gate and the submersible that went down to the Titanic. Whilst the, we don't know exactly what happened to the submersible, one of the big failings of determining what happened was that many ships were actually um, that were searching for this were getting interference between themselves and therefore weren't able to detect what is going on in their environment. This overlapping meant that some ships thought they had found the submersible, but in reality, they were just sensing reflections from other ships. Additionally, what information do individual robots need? How many sensors do they need? What computers do they need? And this will lead on to, we'll talk about it a little bit later as to why some companies don't want to use robots. But this is a very important topic. And if you can find efficient ways to do information work on individual robots, it's a guaranteed um, goldmine of research. On to step two, how do we plan in our environment? Once we've perceived our world, where do we go? Once we know where we are, we need to know where we are going. There is a massive amount of uh, planning algorithms, um, a variety of text textbooks. There is one textbook that I would highly recommend that I do happen to own. It is this very famous textbook um, by Laval. It's called a Planning Algorithms. It is an absolute monstrosity of a textbook. However, it covers every single planning algorithm you could ever come across in research. And what you see on the right here is a very simple um, application of A star pathfinding. And all this does is a method of finding the optimal path from a start to finish. It combines obstacle avoidance with the shortest path determination. And the kind of the example for this is if you're going to school or you know, you're going to your favorite coffee shop or, or to the gym, how do you know what's the fastest way to go? How do you find out? And you use Google most likely, but let's say you know where you're going, but let's say you know there is a crash ahead of you and there's a road closure. Well, you know how to adjust your route. That path planning is kind of inherent to a human, we can do it very easily in our heads, but how other people do it is quite difficult. So that's what we want to achieve with this sort of pathfinding. The biggest problem in this field is exploring routes that aren't favorable. As you'll notice on this algorithm on the right here, it actually explores a route towards the center before determining that the route towards the bottom and then up the side is actually better than going directly across the middle due to the number of obstacles. How do we translate this real-time planning with ensuring that we have some sort of learning-based control there? So there are some good examples in recent years for multi-robot planning. And the first is this sort of planning from Zhang et al. One of the big challenges of planning is how do we manipulate objects? And the example I give is 
the very famous example from, if any of you have seen Friends, there's an example of them trying to get a sofa up through a, a tough staircase. And it's sometimes called the piano movers problem. How do we move a piano through, a, um, through an environment where we know there are obstacles? And this work by Zhang found that we could actually determine how to move a difficult obstacle with multiple robots by splitting the planning system between two different robots. So you have the green robot, which does its planning for itself, and then you have the blue robot that does its own planning. And provided that the object in the middle follows that dotted yellow path, you still have an optimal path. Similar work, um, this is actually from the Dyson Robotics Lab at Imperial College London, and I highly recommend going to check out a lot of their videos. They actually showed that you could use multi-robot planning to estimate optimal paths, particularly at junctions like this. This is a sort of junction you would see not so much in the United Kingdom. We have roundabouts, um, which I know cause problems to a lot of people. But you no, know, in, the, in the United States, these are very common. These junctions where you have cars coming for a lot of time. And whilst there are traffic signals, can be no one really listens to traffic signals. But what this planning algorithm does, it allows them to schedule the paths of the robots. So they don't collide. And this is done with no communication between the robots. They're able to just move freely. All they do is adjust their speed and their plan. It is smooth. There is smooth. There is no collision, no oscillations. Not only that, they can maneuver through an environment and find their way out to the other side. But some challenges, as I mentioned before, computing a local plan versus a computing a global plan. Now, the example I would give is if you are trying to compute a local plan, it's quite simple. If you want to find out how you go from your bedroom to the, to the kitchen or from your kitchen to your living room, that's a very simple plan to do. There aren't very many difficult things to go and provide you don't have a sibling that is getting in your way or you know, if you have a pet, it's very easy to do. But a global plan, how do we go from your house to the gym? We don't always have all the information. And when you're working with multi-robot systems, this environment is changing constantly and you constantly have these new obstacles and new uncertainties being injected in. And this is where it links clearly with the perception. How do we perceive the environment and then compute the local path and the global path because of it? For distributed robots, like the last example I gave on the previous slide, how do we ensure the coverage across a very large area? Now, the example given on the previous slide was on a square meter. These were very small robots. What happens when we talk about the farmland that I mentioned at the beginning? This is several acres and several square miles worth of farmland. How do we actually make sure that we have good distribution, particularly if we want to make sure that all the robots are distributed in such a way that we have good coverage over a large area? And are there guarantees of optimality for multi-robot systems? A lot of the research, particularly in this textbook that I showed and a lot of the other methods in literature, have found that there is optim optimal solutions, but for just one robot. If we have multiple robots, how do we guarantee that those solutions are good? How do we guarantee that these are actually going to work in the real world? Because when you go out into industry, you'll find that one of the big questions you get from kind of manufacturers and producers is, do these solutions work? Is the solution the right solution? And how robust is that solution? How do we guarantee cooperative plans between decentralized robots? If, like on the previous example, we had robots that were decentralized, have no communication between each other, how do we ensure that they are cooperating and working together as opposed to one car deciding that I just have to go through this junction? And self-driving cars pose a very difficult problem. The example I give is when you look at a lot of the Tesla self-driving car crashes, whilst a lot of them are failings of the, the system itself, a lot of the failings of the self-driving car system in a Tesla is that it cannot predict what a human is going to do. Humans are very random. And if you go on a motorway or a highway, you will find out that people are very random when it comes to driving. Now, step three, the final step, control. And this is the bit that I work on directly. So if I go too fast or I miss something, please let me know. We can now see the world. We've determined that we can perceive the world. We now have a plan of where we're going. Now we must actuate. Now we must control. The history of control theory dates back to the early 1940s, post-World War II. And it has seen a massive, massive change. And just to throw some names out there, you've seen people like Richard Bellman, Petragin. You have Hamilton and Jacoby dating back to the 1800s. But in just the last 60 years, we transitioned 
from simple PID control that you see on the bottom here, which is a very, very simple feedback system that you will see pretty much in every major control textbook, to things such as optimal and robust control, where we have a cost function and that we find out what the, we try to minimize this cost function, but we predict what the next step is going to be. And in recent years, with the advent of machine learning and reinforcement learning, learning-based control for robotics, how can we let the robot just train itself? We give it all the data it needs. How does it learn what to do? And robot platforms are very diverse. A lot of the work I've referenced here is either mobile robots, um, such as you know wheeled robots, or manipulators, so armed robots. But robot platforms are very diverse. We have everything from robotic manipulators to drones to mobile vehicles with two wheels, mobile vehicles with four wheels. And in some cases with an aerospace, we have mobile robots with 16 wheels. How do we define control algorithms for every single robot? Is it possible? Some recent examples of multi-robot control, at least the ones I am quite familiar with, is this one on the left. This actually links to the previous slide where we discussed how we did the planning. This is actually the control law behind it. They determine what the object's trajectory needs to be, and then they determine what each robot needs to do. And this adaptive control allows the robots to change the type of robot they are using. So see here, there's actually three different types of robots in this example. We have a pure manipulator, a manipulator on some wheels, and a dual manipulator on four wheels, which mimics kind of human example. You know, we are effectively a two-armed wheeled robot with legs instead of wheels. And on the right here, we have the work um, from the inverse kinematic switch by Tian in 2017, which says, if we cannot figure out how to move a robot by just holding it, what if we change how we're holding the robot? And this inverse kinematic switch or IK switch allows much more complex geometries to be moved. So you see here, after the initial movement, the robot arm changes its position to allow itself to get a better control. Now, this control law is actually quite simple in and of itself. It doesn't actually require any massive computational power, and, th and therefore it's quite easy to deploy. However, there are, as with the other two sections, there are some open challenges. For multi-robot systems, the action space is very large. What do we mean by this is that for every possible, at every possible time step, the options that a robot can do, the actions it can take, are very, very large, and these scale massively with the number of robots you use. If you have, in the case of the previous slide here, we only have two robots moving this arm, but there are still one million possible combinations of actuating positions they could choose. How do they choose which ones? How do they know which ones are optimal? How do we guarantee this optimality? One of the reasons that PID control, proportional integral derivative control, is still the number one control algorithm in industry is because we know how good it is. We can measure how good it is and we can apply it to a vast range of things. PID control has been using everything from robotics to nuclear power con station control and is even nowadays using things like self-driving car control. It is a very optimal solution. So how do we guarantee for multi-robot systems that we get these optimal solutions? Now, the example on the previous slide where we re-grasp a component, that's not always an option. In aerospace, we don't have that choice when we assemble large structures because we actually physically mount the robot end effector to the component. We cannot change that position because that would damage the component. And then from there, how do we know what permissible control laws there are? For instance, we must know what kind of positions we can do, and that therefore defines what actions we can take. Optimization methods, particularly adaptive and optimal control, can get stuck at local optima, i.e. positions and actions that look like they are the best action to take, but in reality they're not. And how do we escape those local optimal positions? Whilst reinforcement learning and learning-based controls are very good at getting out of those local optimas, if you've ever read a reinforcement learning paper, you will see that they have large uncertainties. They are not safe to use in industry. There's a big question nowadays, and I'm telling you this now because we literally had a talk about it this week. The uh, UK Civil Aviation Authority and the European Aerospace Safety Authority, uh, the UK CAA and EASA as we call them, they govern all of the safety systems that we do when we do manufacturing for aircraft. And we had a big talk this week and they determined that we cannot use any major 
learning-based algorithms, and in, this includes machine learning methods such as ChatGPT or you know, generative AI in any of our work because it's just not safe for manufacturing. How do we get those guarantees for learning-based control? Because it represents such a goldmine for control theory. How do we get past that? How do we provide these uncertainties? There are lots of ways, but we need to investigate how they work. So that is all the theory. And I'd like to talk about some examples, particularly in agriculture, manufacturing and construction. And the reason I've done it in this order will become apparent is there are more examples in others compared to some. Starting with agriculture, the two big examples are harvesting. And this example from organic farms is one of the best examples I have ever seen. They are using manipulators mounted onto robots to actually autom autonomously pick fruit from certain grapevines. And they've actually deployed a multi-robot system here in the UK, not very far from where I live in Sheffield, that allows them to pick strawberries at five times the rate of human workers. So in a standard day, they would be able to pick every single strawberry in a strawberry plant farm, which is an amazing achievement for humans. Humans are never able to do that. The average human group of about five operators can take up to six days to pick every single berry. Whereas this system, which combines a robot on a track like a train with a robot manipulator and two small cameras that allowed it to do the entire control system. It, see here, it can detect the fruit. This is the perception we've talked about. It plans the environment it needs to make, and then it picks the strawberries autonomously. And they've, in this company, Organi Farm, just won a contract here in the UK to build five more of these farms, not just for strawberries, but for other fruit as well, such as bananas in some sort of greenhouse, but also onions and other um, plants that are underground. The other example is vertical farming. Now, vertical farming has not really taken off as much as it should. And one of the reasons is for legacy farming. And I, from what conversations I've had with some of the, my Mexican colleagues in the office is that Mexico has a lot of farmland and vertical farms represent a way of tripling the amount of farmland you have. And what you see here is autonomous tractors for these vertical farmland, where you're able to uh, harvest all the vegetables and any other type of produce that you are growing but in a vertical setting. Now, the efficiency of these vertical farms is still up for debate. And there is a genuine, possibly not always a use case for these systems in countries that have lots of farmland, such as po uh, possibly Mexico, the uh, United States. Um, these do not represent a good investment. However, in some countries, like my home country of Israel, it is mostly desert. These vertical farms represent a massive investment that would allow us to scale the amount of produce we make. As of this month, uh, Israel does not import any fruit and veg to its country. Whereas a country like the United Kingdom does import a lot of fruit and veg. We have a lot of tomatoes, for instance, that are from Spain. We could grow these in the UK using vertical farms, and we could use these tractors to autonomously harvest all of these systems. In manufacturing, it's a little bit more straightforward. And the example on the left here is one of the most famous examples, which is autonomous assembly at Audi. And Audi have been very well known for advancing the field of robotics, particularly in manufacturing, dating back um, to the 1970s and 80s when they developed the autonomous shop floor uh, project. And this here uses multiple robots from Fanuc to assemble a car engine for Audi. And this process is completely autonomous. Now, you may be looking at this and thinking, well, this seems slower than a human. You know, the ro these are, this robot is actually sped up 1.5 times speed. And you may think, well, why would you um, um, speed the video up? The robots are slower than humans, therefore they're less efficient. That is correct. However, these robots can run 24 seven. This production line in, I believe it is Hamburg, in Germany, is running every single day of the year. These robots never stop. They are constantly building and the scaling use of multiple robots means they're capable of doing multiple different tasks at the same time. See here, they're performing inspection with linear scanners and measuring every single part of the vehicle, determining what parts marked in green are within tolerance and what parts aren't within tolerance marked in yellow. And if you look back here, you see each robot is equipped to do a different task, assembly, uh, applying some sort of gel, screwing, drilling, riveting, milling, and even um, at times um, doing arc welding. These multiple robots can scale to do a lot of tasks very quickly. Whilst it is a very expensive um, thing to build, 
this system represents a massive investment for manufacturing companies. Similarly, again, here in the UK, Ocado. This is a not the real footage. Unfortunately, they don't provide the real footage to the public, but this is the press release they did of their autonomous um, swarm robotics picking system. This allows them to pick every single food and product in their factory at any given time. Now, Ocado is in a similar ways to, you know, you have your, you can order food to your house. This is being able to order your groceries to your house. And this system allows them to pick every basket from the moment you click buy and it'll be outside and ready to ship within 10 minutes. And this swarm allows them to handle nearly uh, nearly half of uh, nearly 5,000 orders every single day. And here, 65,000 orders every week, which is a massive scale up from what a human can do. If you had humans doing this, it would take several hours and possibly even weeks to fulfill a, a single set of orders. Now, construction I've left last because there is actually a little bit of debate as to whether construction should adopt robotics and should even start investing in multi-robot systems. Unfortunately, the construction industry is quite um, old fashioned, I guess is the correct word. They don't want to use new methods because one, these methods are very expensive to build and deploy. And two, they like the methods they use currently. A lot of construction is done by humans because they have an appreciation for what they are doing. However, some tasks are very difficult and can be quite boring. For example, construction robots such as this one, painting, for instance. How do we automate the, the process of painting? How do we automate the process of you know, collecting dirt and rubbish off of construction paths? These are tasks that humans don't need to perform. They do provide no benefit to the workplace. Why don't we let robots do it? So how we use these methods has to be done accordingly, but also has to be in a way that doesn't cause jobs to go out of business. And one of the big concerns with a lot of robotics companies is how do we avoid massive lay uh, layoffs from con companies that are hiring robots? One of the big things that happened in the United States was Amazon used a lot of robots to do their automated picking for their delivery service. And then they decided to lay off their employees instead. And this was a very unethical and very immoral method to do so. But how do we make sure this doesn't happen in other companies, particularly in construction? But in recent years, we have seen some push towards autonomous construction. And this is an example from a company in America where they are building a house using just this massive robot arm. And they've now received a permit in the state of Nevada and in the state of, I believe it's California as well, to build these houses with multiple robots. And now you could deploy several of these robots and you could build the house completely from scratch with very human intervention. And whilst this robot is quite slow compared to a human placing a brick, the speed at which it builds the entire house is a lot faster. So in a, in a summary, because I'm aware of time, what have, what have we covered today? Multi-robot systems have the potential to improve the feasibility of robotic solutions across a variety of disciplines. We've talked today about agriculture, construction, and manufacturing. But there's beyond that. Search and Rescue is a project I've worked on. I work with some colleagues at ETH Zurich on using multi-robot systems for search and rescue. And in what we saw in the recent um, unfortunate Turkish um, earthquake last year is that these robots can be deployed efficiently and allow us to uh, aid humans in finding people that are trapped. We, the research areas for multi-robot systems follow the trend of single robot research, but they require a bit more intuition. And for, furthermore, they, they acquire a bit more people to actually be interested in this. One of the big things is we need to make sure that these things become more prevalent to the, to the global populace and to researchers as a whole. But more care does need to be taken about how we evaluate the performance and robustness of control. The big thing with multi-robot systems is if a single robot goes crazy, at best you're causing, you know, maybe a half a million dollars of damage, maybe someone gets hurt. If a multi-robot system goes down or causes some massive degradation to, the, to some company, that's a few million dollars, possibly millions lost in terms of performance and could even cost people their lives. We need to be very clear about the performance and robustness of these robot systems before we deploy them. And finally, and this is the big one, the cost of these systems need to be appealing enough to companies and to producers to invest in them. 
one of the big reasons that Airbus is so willing to invest in these systems with myself and with other researchers at the University of Sheffield is that they represent a tangible benefit. Whilst the initial startup cost is very expensive, beyond that, it becomes a much more beneficial investment and allows them to scale the manufacturing capabilities of their systems. So thank you all for listening. Um, I'm aware it is a very kind of whistle-stop talk of multi-robot systems. A uh, big thank you to my direct sponsors who give me the beautiful pleasure of working on this. Um, if you want to connect with me, you're free to reach out to me on Twitter and LinkedIn, and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. All right. In, in this case, in the chat, we have one question. Mm -hmm. In this case, it says, Hi, Ethan. My name is Giselle, and I am the Oswaldo's friend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank a lot for accepting the invitation. And I have a question for you. How do you see the future of robotics and multi-agent system in the industry? That's a very good question. Uh, thank you again for the invitation. How do I see the future? I, I am I'm very uh, optimistic with the future for robotics and in industry, um, but I'm also very concerned. Um, every now and then we see um, papers and reports and news articles on how artificial intelligence and robotics are gonna change the world and take away our jobs and cause whatever calamity that they are talking about at the time. And whilst for a lot of people, um, they see these reports and they say, oh, that's not gonna happen. It's too far away. A vast majority of people do read these reports and they do feel like something bad is going to happen. And something that I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who is a climate scientist researcher, and what she was saying was a big thing that we should have done years ago is be prepared to work with companies and to be ready to present our work to the, the broader public, not just in the standard kind of researchers, you know, conferences like this, or, you know, if you go to a technical conference like, you know, ICRA or AMAS, but rather we should be talking to the public, explaining what our systems do and why we do it this way. I'm very optimistic, as I said, about the future of robotics. I do think in the next few years, we are going to see an increase in the number of robots being deployed across a variety of systems. But at the same time, I think we need to be very careful as where we deploy them and how we deploy them. Where? Because not every industry needs a robot. There are some things that you don't need robots or AI to use, for example, therapy or doctors. But if, let's say, you want to do autonomous surgery, that is definitely a solution with robot systems. And if you want to, let's say, deploy within aerospace, how do we do it in such a way that doesn't co cost people their jobs? And in the current, you know, the current economic climate where, you know, job security is a very important factor for a lot of people, how do we guarantee they're not going to lose their jobs? And what can we do to reassure them that their jobs are going to work alongside them? All Thank right. You for your question. Very good question. Um, all right. Uh, before we continue the, the, the questions, a public service announcement. In this case, everyone that is on the on this session, if anyone wants their uh, attendance certificate, please on the chat write your full name and your email. So in this case, we could uh, give you the, the certificate. Anyhow, the next question. In this case, it's a personal one. Uh, mm -hmm. You you mentioned the the Mars uh, the Perseverance uh, mm -hmm. robot, uh, but uh, in, in this case, I have a question regarding of uh, like um, uh, planetary exploration. In mm -hmm. this case, in in the past, the Cassini Huygens uh, proof that they sent to uh, Titan, the mm -hmm. Mar the moon of uh, Saturn. Uh, I think they only retrieve telemetry and a photo. And mm -hmm. in the um, with the experience that they have of perseverance, they are going to send the dragonfly in, in, in the next few decades. But in this case, my question is regarding of, uh, for example, you said you, you have the road. Where do, where do we want to go? Uh, but in this case, we only have a photo and telemetry. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, for... Uh, for the Mars proof, uh, we have uh, satellites. We have the from the Viking uh, 
mission. Mm -hmm. We have years ahead of, of more data in order mm -hmm. to send our, our proofs now. But in this case, for the dragonfly, we only mm -hmm. have uh, a photo mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, and telemetry. So in this case, how could you um, perhaps apply your uh, your expertise in order to to, to, to send a proof? No, like uh, we, we don't have any more information. No? Yeah. In an ideal world, we would send as many satellites as we could and do as much kind of orbital mapping of Titan before we send down anything. Unfortunately, yeah. um, NASA's budget and a lot of space uh, space exploration budgets are governed by public opinion. Therefore, saying we're going to send 10 satellites to a, a, uh, to a moon far away is not very appealing. But if you say we're sending 10 robots, that's a far more appealing uh, topic to the public. How we um, do that is a very interesting way. There is a prevailing theory in robotics that you only need to account for a certain amount of information and that limited amount of information will allow you to traverse your environment. We know vaguely what Saturn's surface is going to look, uh, Titan's surface, sorry, is going to look like. We know it's a very icy environment. And we also know there is a rigid surface. We've done that with some um, satellite information. And like you said, with the probe and the photo. How we then go from there is very difficult. But I believe, the, and my kind of personal belief is these probes that we send will need to be complete with every single sensor we could possibly find. And we need to be able to map the environment before we even get to the surface. So as the probe is descending to the surface of Titan, it would need to map out its landing environment and then be able to map out the rest of its in, um, environment to continue its planning. And back in the kind of the feedback loop of robotics, it would have to perceive a lot further than what we can um, currently do on Mars, because Mars we've observed is a very open surface for most, most of it. Titan we know very little about. We would have to observe a lot of the environment before we land and then plan the environment ahead of us. And unfortunately, the only real way to do it is to create Titan's surface here on Earth and then evaluate and see how well it can plan and how well it can move around its environment. Okay, uh, thank you for, 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 the, for the answer. In this case, there's another question on the chat. Mm -hmm. It says, yep. uh, from Rigoberto Arroyo Cortez, how do you see the future uh, collaborative efforts uh, in robotics and multi-agent systems in industry from a research perspective, particularly, uh, <laughs> particularly in light of the shift uh, towards more flexible and adapt adaptive, uh, adaptive technology following the COVID-19 pandemic? You know, that's a very good question because that's exactly my research. My research is looking at how we can develop flexible robotic systems in a multi-agent setting. So uh, unfortunately, the, the, the answer is not an answer researchers want to hear. There is a, a general feeling in researchers, particularly in um, robotics, that we don't want to talk to industry and that we develop our systems and then we just say, just go build it. The, the solution is we have to talk directly to industry to find out what they want. One of the big reasons our lab in Sheffield is so successful is all those sponsors I mentioned at the beginning, Airbus, Dyson, GK and Aerospace, Jaguar Land Rover, they come to us with their problems. They say, look, we have a problem that we want to solve. Can you do it with your systems? And we find a way to develop our systems in partnership with them. And I kind of go back to this example, a very famous control theorist from the 50s and 60s, Richard Bellman. And his, his work underlies all of reinforcement learning with the Bellman equation, it's also been uh, applied to optimal control with the hamilton jacobi bellman equation. But Bellman was not researching control theory in the 50s and 60s. Rather, he was working with the US Air Force to develop autonomous flight systems. Because Bellman realized that if he just said, I want to research pure mathematics and control, no one would have given him any funding. But because he said, I want to research autonomous flight, the US Air Force and its partners said, we will invest in your research. And this is where I think researchers need to start, you know, being very clear. They need to say, look, we want to do this, but we want to give you some tangible benefit because all of these companies from Airbus to, you know, even to its competitor Boeing and beyond aerospace as a whole. If you think in terms of, you know, uh, construction, you have some major construction companies such as JCB and here at KPMG. How do you convince them to invest in your research 
Well, you pitch it to them in a way that makes it appealing. You say, oh, we can improve your construction costs. We can reduce your construction costs by 50%. Any construction company is going to take that. Similarly with Airbus and you know, other companies in aerospace. They hear that you can improve how much money they make. They'll invest. But you need to connect directly with the company. And this current mindset of we will do the research and then wait for someone to come to us is not going to work. Researchers have to be proactive about going out into industry and finding out what they want. It's why I'm very grateful that I had two years of industrial experience before I started doing my PhD, because it allowed me to see what actual problems are out there rather than going into research and then wondering why is everyone doing this pure theoretical stuff when there's a lot of problems that can be solved very simply. So I think the answer to your question would be researchers need to let go of their egos for a minute and go and talk to industry directly and say, look, we have some tools. How do you want us to integrate them? And I think once researchers do that, it will be very beneficial uh, to you know, these companies, but also to how we derive the collaboration between research and between industry. All right. And in this case, the chat says uh, from Lourdes Vargas Huerta, excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank and you. from Laura Hernandez Villalobos, thank you, Ethan. It was very interesting presentation. Um, I, I don't know if uh, somebody else wants to ask um, something else. If not, there's no, there's no other questions. Sorry. Feel free to just message me on uh, Twitter or LinkedIn. Um, as of this, as of uh, Elon Musk buying Twitter, I don't use it very often. But if you do message me on there, I will check. All right. Uh, so in this case, I will uh, give the word to uh, Karina. Well, thank you so much, Ethan. Uh, it was a very interesting session. Um, I think we not only uh, listen general information, but we learn a lot about the the new the technologies and so on. And I really appreciate it. I don't uh, belong to this field, and it was pretty interesting to learn about it. So thank you for all the guys who are joining these sessions because I think uh, because we are in different countries, we can share different ways of seeing the world. So we really appreciate that you accept to participate in this and everybody that is joining the session. Thank you so much to Sieka that is giving this space to have people uh, for sharing experiences. Thank you so much to everybody. Thank you Eduardo for uh, organizing this. And I don't know if somebody wants to say something before we close the session. <laughs> 